Films in Focus with David Sterrett is underwritten by The Movie House, your destination for first-run Hollywood and independent movies, and a digital portal to the Met Opera, National Theater Live, and special events worldwide in Millerton, New York, and on the web, themoviehouse.net. David Sterrett is the editor-in-chief of the quarterly review of Film and Video, contributing writer at Cineast, film professor at the Maryland Institute College of Art, Robin Hood Radio's very own critic, and a good guy to talk to. He joins us weekly, the films, The Two Popes, A Hidden Life, and Richard Jewell. Hello, David. Hello, Jill. How are you doing this week? Oh, spectacular. Oh, I am so glad to hear that. Well, I've got three pretty good movies to talk about this week, so you will be super spectacular, maybe, if you want to hear nice things about movies. Uh, none of these is, well, I shouldn't say that. One of these is really, I think, maybe a great movie. The other two are at least, you know, very good and very entertaining. But let us begin with The Two Popes. The Two Popes is another one of these movies which uh, is in theaters and also on Netflix, so people can see it pretty easily if they want to. Uh, and it is, in fact, by the way, all three of today's movies are based on real life incidents, real things that actually happened and real people. Uh, the Two Popes is in fact about two popes. And it is that interesting thing because it is about two simultaneous popes, two, two po- which, which we have right now actually, uh, two popes who uh, are uh, popes at the same time, although one is the actual pope and the other one is sort of a pope emeritus, I believe they call him. So yes, these two main characters are, first of all, Joseph Aloysius Ratzinger, who became Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, who then retired, almost unheard of, hadn't happened for centuries for a pope to simply say, "I retire," uh, and then the other pope uh, is um, the, uh, the, the 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 current actual pope, uh, who is uh, Pope Francis, uh, and these two are the main characters of the film. And so here's what happened in real life for people who may not know this: um, the uh, the pope. Uh, was very, very get, getting kind of old and, and not as, as kind of solid in his health as he had been previously. And the Catholic Church was facing various kinds of oh problems and crises and whatnot. And so he decided, and this was just you know a few years ago, really. Uh, he decided to step down. Uh, and so that meant having a new pope, uh, and of course a new pope came in and became what we, the pope we now have, who is Pope Francis. And um, uh, the, but the old pope is still around. Uh, again, sort of Pope Emeritus. So this, again, is something that it maybe never happened before, that there would be two popes at the same time, even though one was the actual pope. So here's what makes all this especially interesting, which is that when Pope Benedict decided to step down, he had no idea who would be elected by the College of Cardinals to succeed him as the new pope. But it was a very strong possibility that the new pope would be the the, 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 the South American who became Pope Francis, who had a really different philosophy of, of what the Roman Catholic Church is all about than he had. A very interesting thing. Pope Benedict was a very uh, conservative uh, sort of re- 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 trying to embrace and sustain the old ways of the church, whereas the man who became Pope Francis was very much a kind of a reformer and somebody who wanted to bring new ways of thinking and looser ways of thinking and more humanism and less doctrine and that sort of thing. So the big question behind this movie in a way is, why did Pope Benedict go right ahead and retire when he knew that his probable successor would be somebody with a very different philosophy of ruling the Roman Catholic Church uh, very different philosophy from his. So what we have in The Two Popes, what most of the movie consists of, is conversations between these two guys. Uh, we have uh, the, ex- the then existing Pope, Ratzinger, uh, calls in his probable successor to have some private conversations, have some private talks, and some private discussion of all this. And by the way, uh, the, 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 the future Pope Francis does not want to be the Pope. He really doesn't want this to happen. He would rather just go right ahead being a cardinal and in fact just being an ordinary kind of parish priest. Uh, But he sees that this is probably going to be in his future and so he comes in and they have these long discussions. And then along the way in the movie we have flashbacks to the future Pope Francis in his earlier life when he went through various uh, pretty horrible trials of his own in Argentina where he is from and where there was a revolution or a coup actually and where 
read the church was caught up in that and there were all kinds of horrible conflicts there and he was not proud of the way that he comported himself in some respects. So we have a lot of flashbacks to that period of his life, uh, but mainly the thrust of the film is the discussion between these two popes, which means that we have a whole discussion uh, of uh, the whole ideas of humanism in the church and the place of strictness, of tradition, of old ways of doing things versus new ways of doing things. I've seen the two popes more than once, and I have to say that the most glorious thing about it is its acting. Uh, uh, the future Pope Francis, or he, he does become Pope Francis, is played by Jonathan Price, a terrific actor, and Pope Benedict is played by Anthony Hopkins, a truly terrific and marvelous actor, and there are terrific people in the uh, in the supporting cast as well. Uh, the movie is directed by Fernando Marais, uh, a talented director. I don't always like his work all that much. The Two Popes I found to be a pretty successful movie. People seem to like this movie even more than I do. I think it's a good movie, not a great movie. Uh, but boy, people just seem to be very enthusiastic about this film. In a way, it's a buddy movie. In a way, it's a sort of a comedy. But it's a very, very serious comedy that raises all kinds of interesting issues. And I must say, I had a good time watching it. As I said, more than once even. Turning to A Hidden Life. Hidden Life was written and directed by Terrence Malick. Now, he is a somewhat controversial filmmaker because he is very informed by, and here we get back to this again, uh, philosophical and even theological ideas. That's what he does. His early films showed that he had a very distinctive visual style, uh, movies like Badlands and Days of Heaven. But pretty soon he moved into having a very distinct visual style and uh, writing style and structural style and everything about his films is different from the mainstream. He seems to be always wanting to reach beyond the physical material world, which is what movies capture after all, uh, into some sort of realm of the mystical, even the, even the spiritual. And this seems to be his basic underlying aim in most of his major films, perhaps most emphatically in a fairly recent film a few years ago called The Tree of Life, where he gets into stuff drawn, stuff drawn from his own family history, uh, but where where there are things in it that appear to be literal visions of heaven. Uh, and he always seems to be seeing the human world, the material world, the physical world as opening up onto another kind of a world, a mystical world or a spiritual world, uh, in ways that we really can't fathom, but that his films try to evoke, even if they can't really depict or define it. So that's, that's kind of a little bit of a primer on what Terrence Malick does in his movies. Hidden Life is different from him because it deals with history to a certain extent. It takes place uh, during the Nazi era, and the main character, is an Austrian man who is recruited, not just recruited, but uh, conscripted to fight for the Nazis in World War II, and he cannot bring himself to do it. It's not just because he despises the Nazis, although he does. He despises war. He is a conscientious objector. And, you know, as, as, as one may well anticipate uh, when thinking about the subject of this movie, uh, the Nazis, the Germans uh, in the Hitler era were not too fond of conscientious objectors. So we know that he is going to be in for an enormous amount of trouble. So we have basically a portrait of this man whose name is August Deal and his wife, and they, they are farmers and they live a simple life out in the country. And what happens when the war comes along and then when his conscription comes along and what they go through and how they are separated and he uh, is taken custody by the Nazis, etc., and things move on from there. Now, what makes all of this extraordinary, and by the way, this movie is just about three hours long, so be ready for that. What makes all of this extraordinary is Malick's visual style. Uh, the camera moves, it glides, it flows, it transcends, it just soars through the landscapes and, 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 and through the human soul almost, and it does all kinds of wonderful things. As a visual experience, A Hidden Life is absolutely absolutely magnificent, and that's not too strong a word to live. Story-wise, uh, it has basically this one storyline, what's going to happen to our conscientious objector as things go along, and we certainly do find that out. The one thing in the film that I found implausible, uh, and it's pretty basic to the film, and I think I, I am willing to ascribe this to poetic license and to accept it, uh, but the Nazis who have August Deal in, in, in custody, uh, the various officers and even soldiers, but mainly the officers and the people who call him for meetings and hearings and interrogation sessions, really seem interested 
interested in discussing with him his conscientious objectorship, his ideas. Uh, they seem to be very interested in this. And I mean, my sense is that in real life, the Nazis would just sort of put a bullet in your head as soon as they found out you weren't going to go fight. But they're always calling him in and having discussions with him and trying to persuade him to think otherwise. And I found that rather implausible. That said, Terence Malick is literally a philosophical filmmaker. He was a philosopher uh, before he became a filmmaker. Uh, and he is fascinated by these questions and he gets you pretty interested in them too. So uh, again, I found A Hidden Life mainly interesting, not just as, a, as an acting movie or a story movie, but as a visual experience. On that level, it is absolutely sensational and I think probably the best movie of 2019. Finally, Richard Jewell. Richard Jewell is made by Clint Eastwood. Clint Eastwood, we all know who he is. <laughs> Clint Eastwood has been around for a very, very long time. He is a pretty old man now, but he is unstoppable. He keeps directing movies, not so much acting anymore, but he keeps directing movies, and now he has done it again. And as some people will know right from the title, Richard Jewell is about a security guard. And again, this is based very much on real life. Uh, back at the 1996 Olympics, uh, there was a terrorist bomb that went off causing horrible death and suffering that would have been even worse except that a security guard named Richard Jewell spotted the backpack with the bomb in it and was able to alert some actual law enforcement uh, who were able to at least mitigate the damage a bit. So it would have been even worse without Richard Jewell. And for a tiny little while, Richard Jewell was hailed as a hero. The guy who spotted this, who took action right away, who alerted other authorities and made things a bad situation be not nearly as bad as it might have been. But then almost immediately things changed. The FBI decided that he might have been the one who planted the backpack. Richard Jewell is kind of an overweight guy who lives with his mother and he's only a security guard and he's done some weird things in his time. He's always been like a wannabe real police officer and uh, has done things like when he was working as a security guard for a college, he would go out and stop people who were driving unsafely on the roads, even though that was totally outside the college's jurisdiction and he got fired for that. So because of his eccentric behavior, because of his eccentric uh, 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 professional behavior uh, because of just his general weird personality. Uh, the FBI decides this guy fits the profile. He might be one of these people who set the bomb himself so that he could then discover the bomb and who could then be a hero and maybe this is what he has done. So the FBI is after poor Richard Jewell. And that is what the movie is about. And again, all of this really happened. I remembered when all this happened. And he was all over the media, Richard Jewell. Every kind of media imaginable, print, broadcast, internet, every kind of that, that there is as being the, the great suspect in this, the one who probably did this terrible thing. And then, of course, it turned out, and this is not really a spoiler, because again, this all really happened, that he hadn't done this at all. That he really was, and we see this in the movie itself, that he really was this innocent guy who found the backpack and alerted the authorities, etc. So that's what the movie is about. Now, first of all, the movie is just marvelously, marvelously acted. Uh, Richard Jewell is played by an actor named Paul Walter Hauser, and he is simply perfect for this role. And I just loved watching him every step of the way. He is not conventionally attractive as a person, uh, but he just is perfect for this role and he's just wonderful. Sam Rockwell, uh, an actor for whom my respect keeps going up. He was in the recent TV miniseries, uh, uh, Fosse Verdon, where I think he is just sensational. And he plays uh, Richard Jewell's lawyer, Watson Bryant. Uh, he is simply excellent at that. I have to mention John Hamm, who is in it, uh, as a sort of lead FBI agent. Kathy Bates, a wonderful actor uh, who plays Richard Jewell's mother. Anyway, a wonderfully acted movie and a really well-directed movie. Clint Eastwood is a really good movie director, and he has been for decades now. Not all of his movies are good. I have to add that right away. And in fact, just in recent times, uh, he's made some movies which I think uh, are, are pretty bad. Uh, he can make movies that can be really, really, really boring. Uh, the, five, seven, the 1517 to Paris, which is another movie based on real life and terrorism. 
I found really tedious. His movie Sully has a wonderful performance by Tom Hanks, but again, really kind of tedious. His movie American Sniper is kind of mean-spirited. So, you know, even in recent years, he's made some movies that are pretty bad. On the other hand, I really liked his movie last year, The Mule, uh, and I really like Richard Jewell. Now, here's the big single big problem with Richard Jewell. It is a movie about fake news, to use the current can't phrase. It is a movie about how the media deceive us, about how we shouldn't trust the things that we're getting from the mainstream media. And in the current political climate, that is not a very helpful message to be coming at us from a movie. But that political reservation aside, I found Richard Jewell a really exciting movie, an interesting movie, a gripping movie, even though you know how it's going to come out, and above all, a terrifically acted movie. Clint Eastwood still knows how to direct a film, and I'm glad to say he's still around. And by the way, I just want to take one more second and plug my book, The Cinema of Clint Eastwood Chronicles of America. The book's been out for a few years now, but Clint is still making movies. What will happen next? And that is my Based on Real Life story this week, Joe. For which we thank you as ever, David Sterrett. Films in Focus, The Films, The Two Popes, The Hidden Life, and Richard Jewell. 